All right, um, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, so tonight we're going to have a lot of fun, as usual. Uh, we have a number of different things to discuss. Um, in fact, I think, yeah, so we're going to start tonight with a kind of a, a like a Dharma appetizer. So this is going to kind of get us going. So this is not the, um, we're not doing the sutra just yet. Um, so we're going to hold off on that. I just have, I, I made another Dharma discovery. And I always like to share my Dharma discoveries with everyone. It's part of the joy of teaching this course is it's always unfolding. We're discovering, we're studying, we're learning. And so this is going to be a little complicated, but only because we're going to be dealing with some history that you may or may not know already. So it might be really easy, but I want to share this with you. So <laughs> there's a Buddhist text. It's not exactly a sutra. It is sometimes called a sutra, and I'll tell you about that, but it's a very famous Buddhist text, and it is called, at least in Sanskrit, it's called the Melinda Panha, the questions of Melinda, or it is known as the questions of King Melinda, um, Melinda, M-I-L-I-N-D-A. So this is an odd, a very odd Buddhist text because it is in the official canon, like it is, it's very, it's why it's sometimes called a sutra is because it's in the official Buddhist canon and it's in the official Buddhist canon of both the Southern schools of what would be called Theravada Buddhism, but it's also part of the canon of the Northern school of early Buddhism in particular, the Sarvasti Vaden school, which I'm going to tell you a little bit about tonight. So this is a really, really, really interesting text that hasn't really been properly studied. It has been properly translated in 1890. And then once again in 1963. So the translations of both of these are a little outdated, but let me tell you a little bit about this text real quick. <clears throat> and by the way, this is all going to tie into the, the conversation we've been having and the sutras we've been studying. All of this is relevant, I promise you. So here's the thing about it. <clears throat> this book, and this is the version, this is the version that I have, The Questions of King Melinda. So what this is, it is, it is a record. It is a historical record of a conversation, a, a kind of a debate that took place between a Buddhist monk and the king of Bactria or the king of a part of Bactria. Now, you might not know what Bactria is, so let's have a little quick conversation. So let's keep in mind, too, by the way, that the Buddha died around 483 BC. So it's going to be tricky here for a minute because we're going to be dealing with BC time, right, which runs the other way. <laughs> So the Buddha dies about 483 BC in what is today Bihar, India. So sort of like central eastern India. What happens is, is that you may have heard of someone known, uh, known as Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great might, you know, be significant to you. He might not mean anything to you, but a little bit of history that's helpful to know 
is that there was a region in what is today Greece, but at the time and the time period that we're talking about is like the three, maybe like 340 BC, 350 BC, and then, but then going to like 330 BC and specifically around 325 BC. It was during this period of time, so 350, 340, 330, it was during this time that Alexander the Great was leading a giant military campaign across the world. And this campaign began in what is today Greece, but Alexander the Great extended the Macedonian Empire, so he was Macedonian, and he extended the Macedonian Empire east, going all the way through Egypt, going all the way through Iran, going all the way east, and he eventually gets all the way to India. Like, this is kind of a big moment of history. And this is not, by the way, this is not a celebration of military campaigns or anything like that. But what this is, though, it's kind of the first meeting of East and West, of like Western culture, kind of over there in Europe, Greece, coming into contact with Eastern culture in India. Now, it was around the year 326 BC that Alexander the Great conquered what is today the Punjab area of Pakistan. So after Alexander the Great conquers this region, and by the way, this region of what is today Pakistan, the Punjab area of Pakistan, that is a region that went under a bunch of different names, but it would have been known as, at times, it was known as Bactria, B-A-C-T-R-I-A, -A, Bactria. Now, the thing that you need to know is that when Alexander the Great came all the way to the Punjab area of Pakistan and established it as a Macedonian Greek um, capital, after Alexander the Great died, that region remained a Greek-speaking, using the Greek alphabet region. And then, after Alexander the Great died, in that region, there was a succession of rulers, Greek-speaking, with allegiance to Macedonia. And so there were these series of kings and so if you go forward in time and you go all the way to around the year 140 BC, it was during this time from around one, I forget exactly how long he reigned, but around 140 and then going all the way to the year 130 BC, in this region of what is today Pakistan, there was a Greek-speaking king named Menander, Menander I. But in Sanskrit, that person's name gets kind of transliterated as Melinda. And indeed, we have other historical records that tell us that King Menander... Melinda, King Menander I, did indeed become a Buddhist and effectively, ru not ruled, but basically that region of Bactria, what is today Pakistan, becomes a little Buddhist kingdom of, of not little, actually, a pretty big Buddhist kingdom. It's during the reign of King Melinda or Menander I, that there was supposedly a debate between a Buddhist monk named Nagasena 
and King Melinda. And the debate was recorded. And that's what is known as this text called the Melinda Panha. Now, this text does, like all other Buddhist texts, it does make its way to China. And in the third century AD, so not too far into the future, the questions of Melinda was translated into Chinese. But in Chinese, they call it the Nagasena Bhikshu Sutra. So the Sutra of the monk Nagasena. So, you know, they, they, uh, they emphasize the importance of the monk, not the king in that way. All right, everybody okay with all this history real quick? Awesome. Yeah, I know, it's, it's complicated, but all, all you need to know is that there's this really old text that exists called The Questions of King Melinda, Buddhist text. Now, of course, if you read anything about this, modern scholars will sort of refuse to believe that this event sort of took place. And they, modern scholars, everybody wants to put this, you know, that this was written way after the fact and every, and they kind of made it up and it was probably written closer to the common era. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I understand the scholarly arguments why they would suggest that. It's not what we're here to talk about though tonight. What we're here to talk about is that all, oh, and by the way, it's a it's a very fascinating um, text because it ultimately it ha you know this monk Nagasena he explains to the king Buddhism like all of it, and so what's so fascinating about this book is that it's a it's like a time capsule of what did Buddhism look like in the second century BC, 300 years after the Buddha died? Like what would, what did Buddhism look like? This is an amazing detail of what Buddhism had become in those 300 years after the Buddha died. In the beginning, it's towards the, be <clears throat> excuse me, it's towards the beginning of Nagasena and King Melinda's debate. And what it comes down to is Nagasena says to King Melinda, <clears throat> so how did you how did you get here? Like, how did you, you know, because he the king came to see uh the monk uh Nagasena. And so Nagasena says, How did you how did you get here? And the king says, by way of a chariot. And Nagasena says, Well, tell me. Is the chariot the axle? And Nagasena says, well, no. And Nagasena says, is the chariot the wheels? Is it the, you know, the cab? Is it the, you know, and he la labels all the different parts of the chariot. And basically, Nagasena walks the king through this question of where's the chariot? Like, what is the chariot? Is it the wheels? Is it the axle? Is it this? And is it that? And then ultimately, and let me just kind of read this to you. Uh, so then Nagasena says, then thus king, I can discover no chariot. Chariot is a mere empty sound. What then is the chariot that you say that you came here in? So they go through all of that. And then this was why I told you all of this. So eventually the, the king is sort of blown away by this idea. And Nagasena says, yeah, for it was said by our sister, Vajira in the presence of the Blessed One, 
just as it is by the condition precedent of the coexistence of its various parts, so it is that the word chariot is used. Just so is it then that the skandhas are there when we talk of being. It's a, it's a really bad, weird translation, but I was very surprised to see this reference to Vajira because we had just read the Vajira Sutra and I had never read the Vajira Sutra. But what this sort of at least revealed to me is that I was always under the impression that the Buddha at some point used the example of the chariot. And then I was under the assumption, the false bad assumption, I was under the assumption then that Vajira, the nun named Vajra, I thought she was quoting the Buddha. From this, it would sound like, no, no, no. It was Vajira, the nun, who came up with this whole chariot analogy. For me, that's actually really important, like super interesting, super significant, especially when you know from when we talked about that Vajira Sutra, that there is something very similar to the Vajra Sutra, meaning the Vajra Pranyaparamita Sutra, meaning the message of the Vajra Pranyaparamita Sutra is very similar to the message of the nun Vajira's Sutra. So this, hearing her, it, you know, that she is the author of this whole chariot analogy, I was very impressed by that, let's say. And so I wanted to share that with you. And I also wanted to share you the unique nature of this text. So for any Dharma heads out there, that's sort of your appetizer for tonight. But again, we're going to talk about the chariot. Like, that's what we've come to talk about. We're just going to do it in a slightly different way. So, everybody okay with me leaving that? Oh, yeah, please, no. Questions, comments, answers, and ideas. I have what I think is a basic question that I feel like I should know the answer to, but I don't, which is, uh, you, when you say it's not a sutra, Ah. What, what makes it not a sutra? I, I, I realize I don't know what makes a sutra a sutra and a, another text just a text. Sutras are Buddha vach. Okay. The voice, like they have to be spoken by the Buddha. That's, what, I that's, <laughs> that's what makes actually when we did the nuns, when we did the, the Bhikshuni sutras, it's what make those so interesting is that they are not the words of the Buddha but they are sutras. So they are Buddha Vach. And this word Vach means the voice or the Buddha speech. But but but, but I, I I don't understand. You just, I, I, didn't you just contradict yourself? Can you yep. explain? <laughs> I, uh, sort of. Sort of. Sort of. Um, you can, you can, you can take the idea of Buddha Vach, the, the voice or the words of the Buddha, you can take that to mean literally the things the Buddha said, or you can take it as authoritatively Buddhist approved. Like okay. it's Buddha, it's the words of the Buddha, okay. even though they came out of the mouth of Vajira. <laughs> so somebody, not you, somebody decided that these things, Vajira's speech was a sutra but someone else just someone also decided that the, the king melinda's book was ah, not a but that's an easy one because the questions of king melinda came hundreds of years after the buddha whereas vajira was alive at the time of the buddha okay so it has to have been someone who was alive at the time of the buddha sort of, sort <laughs> okay, of. Next. yeah yeah but, okay. and and indeed by the way and i did want to mention in the Chinese tradition, they call everything a sutra. But that's because the, the Chinese word uh, jing, a jing is like a classic. It doesn't have the connotations that it does in, in the Indian Buddhist tradition. So, Noe? Yeah, I just, uh, 
just uh, I had a question that came up when you was the questions to the king. Uh, was this in Greek originally? No. Okay. Oh, you mean like when? Could, yeah, when it happened, was he he was a Greek speaking king, probably speaking three or four languages. I'm just curious. Indeed, I think we are to presume that at that time in that place, most people were speaking multiple languages. That's the, our presumption, but yeah. But this is preserved. The questions of King Melinda is in the Pali. It's in the Pali canon. It's in the Sanskrit canon and it's in the Chinese canon. So, yeah. okay. But again, as promised though, we're gonna get back to the chariot idea. We're gonna get back to that. But what we're gonna do is, is tonight's sutra is this it's this upada or yeah upada padi tasana sutta it's a mouthful but it's this uh what do they translate it as uh anxiety from clinging or agitation through clinging yeah so those are the ideas um uh, and once again, if, if if I didn't mention this before, you know, we're reading from the Samyutta Nikaya. We're still in the section on the skandhas. So we're still talking about sutras dealing with the five aggregates. This is sutra number seven of the first section of the skanda section. And as I mentioned before, you know, like this title it's not really a title. It's just a descriptor of the contents of the sutra, if that makes sense. So don't take the title too super seriously in that way. But let's dive in at Shravasti. Oh, and I'm on page 865, if anybody has this. And we gave you a link to the Sutta Central version. So at Shravasti, the Buddha said this, Bhikshus, I will teach you agitation through clinging and non-agitation through not clinging. Listen to that and attend closely. I will speak. Yes, venerable sir, those Bhikshus replied. And the blessed one said this, and how, bhikshus, is there agitation through clinging? Here, bhikshus, the uninstructed worldling, who is not a seer of the noble ones, who is unskilled and undisciplined in their dharma, who is not a seer of superior people and is unskilled and undisciplined in their dharma, that common worldling, regards form as self or the self as possessing form or form as in self or self as in form. That form changes and alters with the change and alteration of form Consciousness becomes preoccupied with that change of form. Agitation and a constellation of mental states born of preoccupation with the change of form remain obsessing the mind. Because the mind is obsessed, one is frightened, distressed, and anxious. And through clinging, one becomes agitated. Lot to, lot to discuss just in that paragraph. So, but by the way, that, that formula that we just walked through, the self being form or the self as having form or form as in self or self as in form, that's going to go for sensations and then perception and conditioning and consciousness. Ah, uh, page 865, Renata. Okay, so... Tonight, we're going to do a deep search for the self. 
Where is the self in all of this? So really quickly, let's get some language, uh, some language stuff figured out. Um, let's see. Uh, the first line, and how bhikshus, is there agitation from clinging or through clinging? Well, we have two words. Upadana is the clinging. And if you've been coming to Dharma doors, you know that I, I like to translate upadana as appropriation. And that's because there's a tradition within Buddhism of speaking about the appropriating mind, which is actually called the adana consciousness. The adana vinyana is the appropriating mind. And that word adana is etymologically basically the same as this idea of upadana, appropriation, owning, claiming. That's the idea of appropriating. So clinging, yes, we are talking about like holding on tightly, but we need to keep in mind with Buddhism, yes, you can cling with your hands, meaning you can cling with your body, but we are sort of mainly interested, at least tonight, into clinging of the mind. So clinging of the mind isn't with your hand. Clinging with the mind is like the idea of ownership. The idea that that this is this is my hoodie. It's mine. If that's I don't cling I don't necessarily cling to it this way, but I cling to it mentally with this idea that it's mine. So we want to be looking at clinging as a, a little more subtle. It's not just physical clinging, it's mental clinging as well. So let's think about appropriating or clinging. And then the other word that we're talking about tonight is this, this pari, let me get the correct pronunciation, paritasana. So paritasana is actually two words, pari and tasati. Tasati Tasati could be pronounced tarati. And that word, tasati or tarati, is where the English word terror comes from. And it comes through Latin. So tasati or tarati, terror, is the kind of a translation of, of this paritasana. So paritasana is like fear, terror, anxiety. It's like, it's, it's that kind of state of panic. A panic attack would definitely be paritasana. So that is the emotional quality that we're talking about tonight. The, I, the state of being agitated, but I don't think agitated quite captures it. It's about, again, being nervous, being stressed, being anxious, being panicked, terror-stricken. All of that is included. So there is that, meaning there is that panic or agitation from clinging, from appropriating. That's what the Buddha is going to teach us. The Buddha said, I'm going to teach you agitation from clinging and then non-agitation from non-clinging. So the Buddha says, and this is, by the way, this is a stock phrase. Um, the one who is not a seer of the Aryas, one who is not a seer of the worthy ones, one unskilled and undisciplined in their Dharma, and one who is not a seer of superior persons, and who is unskilled and undisciplined in their dharma, that's a stock phrase for somebody that's just not on the path, who hasn't practiced, doesn't know about Buddhism, is yeah not on the path. But then we get into, and by the way, 
this sort of fourfold search for the self, you find this in a lot of suttas. This is a very common thing. The reason why I chose this particular sutra tonight is because there's nothing but this fourfold search for the self. So I wanted to stay kind of like laser focused tonight on just this one idea. So that's why I chose this sutra. Plus, who doesn't want to be agitated? Who doesn't want to alleviate their anxiety and their panic, right? I know I do. So, okay. So this fourfold pursuit, and by the way, once again, it's this question of the self. And tonight the question is, okay, where, where, where is that self? And what we're going to be examining is the self as being the physical body of form or sensations or perception or conditioning or consciousness. So for the rest of the night, we're going to be walking through all of those. But let's begin with the first. So let's understand this fourfold, these four possibilities. So, oh, and by the way, in terms of language, I want to make it really clear. We are talking about, and if you're looking at, you know, the, um, the Sutta Central site, if you don't know, the Sutta Central site is amazing because they have like the Pali version of the Sutra. They have the Chinese versions. They have multiple English translations. So it's a great resource. So if you happen to be looking at the Pali version of this, you will notice right away that we are talking about the Atta or the Atman. So it's about thinking that the Atman is the body of form. But let me remind you, the term Atman or Atta in Pali, translating that word Atman as self, is it's tricky. And it's, it's tricky because we, I, or what have you, you know, we are these sort of 20th, 21st century people. And what I'm getting at is, is that we, whether we like it or not, we are very influenced by like Freudian psychology, basically. Even if we don't even know anything about Freudian psychology, if you know the word ego and even think in terms of people being egocentric or egotistical, that's all Freudian ways of thinking. And what I mean is, is that Freud really introduced this idea of the ego as like an idea that we now talk about. And so what I'm getting at is, is that when we English speaking 21st century people think of the self we already have a kind of certain idea in mind about what that means, what it refers to. The Atman though, the Atman is a totally different idea than the ego. It's like super different. And that's because we need to keep in mind that in the Buddhist tradition, in the Indian traditions, it is the Atman that reincarnates. That's what the Atman is, is. And what that means is, is that the Atman, at least in traditional uh, Indian thinking, the Atman isn't this particular body or, you know, this particular name, Michael, this particular sex, this particular gender, this particular anything, because the next life, I could be a dog. I could be, the, you know, it could be any number of things. So the Atman is that which keeps getting reincarnated in all of these different bodies. And we, most of us in the West who are thinking about the self, it doesn't have anything to do with reincarnation. The self is about my ego, my sense of self, my self identity. So I just want to make it really clear right now 
that I'm going to keep using the word self tonight as a translation for Atman. And I think that that's actually fine. And I've done Dharma talks about this in the past where it ultimately kind of doesn't matter. But I do want every, I want everybody to be aware that when they're talking about the Atman, they're not exactly talking about the self as we understand it. So that might, that may or may not come up again. But as you know, though, or as I hope you know, Buddhism is a tradition founded upon the teaching of anatman, no atman. There isn't an atman. There isn't anything reincarnating in that way. Now, there is reincarnation, but there's no thing being re reincarnated, no particular thing being reincarnated in Buddhism. And this is the idea of anatman. But for the uninstructed worldling who doesn't see the noble ones, who doesn't see superior persons and doesn't understand their dharma, for that regular worldling, the regular worldling regards form as atman, form as self. Or self as possessing form or form as in self or self as in form. Let's explore. So the first one of these, the rupam atato samanu pasati. If you break that down and get your dictionaries out, the first of these is our common worldling who's uninstructed in the Dharma thinks the self is the body. And let's remember that the first aggregate, rupa, is the body of form, the body of four elements. So what somebody out there might think that the self is synonymous with the physical body of form. That's one idea. The next idea, the self as possessing form, this is a subtler idea, and it isn't the idea that the self is synonymous with the body of form, but it is the, the idea that the self takes on a form. And this form, by the way, it could be gross material form, or it could be more subtle form, meaning if you were a meditator in a dionic heaven, or if you were even in a kind of deeper state of meditation, where you were sort of have transcended the physical body, it's the idea that there is still a delineated self of form like maybe you have a a body of light it's still a body of form it's a different kind of form but it's still a form so the first of these is that the self is the same as form the other is the idea that the self takes on a form but remember it's the common worldling unskilled in the dharma that thinks the body of form is the self or who thinks the self takes on a body of form. Everybody doing okay with those two options? We're gonna dissect these a little bit more. I just wanna understand the possibilities. The next two, so another way that we can misunderstand this is by thinking that form is in self. And this is basically, as far as I could tell from all the different commentaries on this, this is the idea that your, this physical body of form of yours is in your mind. 
So there's you, there's the self, but this body is like a psychic projection of that self in that way. And there, by the way, all of these are possible beliefs for where the self is. So there's that option, this idea that form is in self or form is in the Atman, which is again, the idea that the, the whole physical world of form, which includes the body of form, is all in the self. Or the very last of these, or the self is in form. And that is the idea of the self, the Atman, as being like in there somewhere. So, so the self is in the body of form, or form is in the self. So those are the last two. Or this physical body is the self. It's, you know, that we're going back to the first one that the self is the physical body or just the idea that the self has a form. Everybody okay with those four possibilities? Now, the first of these, of course, the idea that the, that the self is the physical body, this is one that we talk about a lot in Dharma doors and we dismiss it very quickly because the idea is if you lost your hands, would you think that you have ceased to exist? No, you would just say, I don't have any hands anymore. And right there, that eliminates this idea that the self is the same as the body of form. Now, if you're willing to get on board with the idea that there's sort of a, quote, new self arising at every moment and oh this new self doesn't have hands well that's basically buddhism or at least that's like basic hinayana buddhism is this idea of like an ever-changing ever-evolving aggregation of the five skandhas we're talking about the identifying of the self as the physical body and then when we look at that, we can examine how that doesn't really add up in terms of a, a possible self. So there's that. Then there's this idea of the self as in form, the self having a form. Now, all of these, by the way, I, I want to kind of... Um, I, I want to make it through all the skandhas and kind of do this exploration... So I don't want to get too waylaid. And what I mean by that is we could go through these meticulously and there are strong counter arguments for why the self might have a form. And the point is, is that there are other philosophical and religious traditions out there that do believe there is an Atman and do believe the Atman is either in the, in the body of form or is synonymous with the body of form. So my point is, is that you can find arguments for all of these. Let, so let's just sort of take it, not exactly just take it at face value, but let's sort of understand that the Buddha is saying that to think that the self is the body of form from a Buddhist point of view, is an unskillful way of thinking in that sense. Now, of course, all of this has to do with this idea of that, that self, that individual you idea, right? And we're trying to find where that could possibly be. And what I want you to kind of now think about, because I do want to kind of start moving along, what we want to kind of start thinking about is, okay, there's one way of thinking about myself. And it's thinking about the self as having something to do with this particular body. Okay. 
But let's review again. How is it that there is dukkha? How is it that there is suffering and this terror and all of that from clinging in terms of thinking of the self as having form? Let's, again, let's look at this. The Buddha says that this is what happens. A common person thinks that the self, that thinks that they are the physical body, that it is synonymous or that it's in there or whatever. And then that form changes. Or it alters. And with the change and alteration of physical form, consciousness becomes preoccupied with the change of form. Agitation, which is this terror, this anxiety, and a constellation of mental states born of preoccupation with the change of form remain obsessing the mind. Because the mind is obsessed, one is frightened, distressed and anxious, and through clinging, one becomes agitated or terrorized. So what we wanna notice is that there's this mind consciousness that notices the gray hair, that notices the changes of the body and then becomes preoccupied with those changes and gets agitated as a result. This is something to contemplate. This is something to think about. In preparation for tonight, I was contemplating this. I was thinking about this. I was noticing how I too am agitated when this changes. And it's not actually exactly what you think. We have to, we have to, um, how can I put this? Reserve or hold judgment for a moment. And I just want you to notice that, let's say, what could, what could it be? It, so many things, really. But let's say, what's something that would change? I mean, it's always changing all the time. But I'm trying to think of a change like... Uh, you know, de basically what I'm thinking of is develop developing an ailment in which the body changes, right? It's like I used to have, like, I don't know why I keep thinking of like having like a, a sty or like an eye infection. And the idea is, is that yesterday I didn't have an eye infection. And then something changes with the body and I become obsessed with it. I'm in the mirror. I'm looking all the time. I, the mind becomes obsessed with a change in the physical form of the body and gets agitated because there's been a change. Oh my God, a change in that way. That's what they're talking about. And so again, it's this is a contemplation. This is a, a meditation and looking about are you agitated when your physical body changes in some way, shape, or form? Just notice. Again, don't judge it, but just notice if you, too, get agitated when things change in that way regarding the body of physical form. Jenny? Oh, no? Hmm? We're coming. We're coming. Here we go. It's just basic aging. Sure. It that's like the the main one that's happening all the time. It's happening all the time. Yeah. But notice that there's that mind that can get preoccupied with it. Oh, absolutely. There's not a one of us in this Zoom room that doesn't have a moment. Mhm. Mm yeah. So, let's now what we kind of would then maybe want to notice is Self or no self, we've identified a source of our anxiety. 
And it's this idea that, no, 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 no. I'm not supposed to be this way. I'm supposed to be that way. And that's one of the sources of agitation there is this idea of, no, 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 no. I'm supposed to have two perfect eyes. I can't have an eye infection. I'm supposed to have two good eyes. So we want to notice, again, the agitation in that way. Now, the sutra does the thing, which is that it just truncates and abridges all of this. And it's unfortunate because I think it's actually important to contemplate the idea that a common worldling would regard sensations as self or self as in sensations or self, let me get the language right, or so it would be the common worldling regards sensations as the self or self as possessing sensations or sensations as in self or self as in sensations. So in order to think about this one, we want to start with this. Ju just take, yeah, just take a moment to come into bodily awareness. And what we're talking about in terms of Vedana, sensations, let's remember from last week's deep dive into the skandhas, that sensations, it's not just about what you're feeling with the body or what you're hearing or what you're seeing or what you're smelling. So it's not just about the senses. Vedana is about the way you react to sensations. Do you want more of it or do you want less of it? So it's about the push and the pull of sensing where we want more or we want less. But what I want you to notice in terms of sensations, just take a moment and think about something going on, maybe like across the room or even something going on in some other room of your house or wherever you are. What I'm getting at is, can you sense or feel in that way or see or hear what's going on like in your neighbor's house or whatever? Probably not. And what I want you to notice is you don't cling to those non-sensations. You cling to these particular sensations, meaning the ones that are coming from quote unquote your body. So I just want to, right away, when we're trying to think about how is it that the self could be synonymous with sensations? Well, it would be basically saying, yeah, I am not this physical body, but I am this experience, meaning these sensations that are being had right now. This is me. I am these sensations. So this would be a common worldling, unskillful in the Dharma, thinking that sensations are the self. And I want you to, and again, tonight is very contemplative. And I want you to think about how you could do that. Like, think about how you could identify yourself with the sensations that you're having in that way. And what I want you to notice is, is that you're not identifying with over here. You're not identifying with over here. You're identifying with the, the sensations. And that would be thinking that sensations are the self or sell or what's the language or regarding 
self as possessing sensations. So not that I am the sensations, I have sensations. So sensations are in the self. Or one regards sensations as in the self or self as in sensations. It's about thinking that this self has something to do with these sensations, that the self has to be, the self has to be in those sensations somewhere. But then if we do that, if we're a common worldling and we identify the self as those sensations, then you know what happens? Those sensations change and alter. And with the change and alteration of those sensations, the consciousness becomes preoccupied with them. So what I want you to think about is this. Let's say you're taking a nice hot shower and the sen it's the sensations are pleasant. And you're like, ah, oh, this is so nice. And then the hot water goes out. And it's a stream of icy cold water. And you're like, ah, the sensations change and altered. And notice that the body gets upset when there's that shift. I was having such a good time in the hot water. What's with this cold water? You can't have a good time with cold water? Like, what's up? But what we want to notice is, is that when sensations change, a moment ago, just just uh, making things up. A moment ago, my toes felt fine. And then I stubbed my toe. And now there's a new sensation. And the mind becomes preoccupied with this alteration and change in sensations. And from the alteration and change in sensations, the mind becomes agitated. Once again, it's, this tonight is about just contemplating. Are you agitated when your sensations change? Just putting it out there as something to think about. But again, what we're doing is, is that we're analyzing the body of form, noticing that we can appropriate that body of form as self. But then when we do that and the self change or the body of form changes, the self doesn't like it and it gets agitated. Same thing with the body of sensations. And same thing with perception. So when you're, when you are in a dream and you're perceiving a world of objects and things, right? So that would be perception. We're not talking about a body of form because you're in a dream. So there's no physical body. There's no getting, you know, there's no physical body in that situation. Yes, there are sensations at play in a dream. So everything I just said goes for sensations. But what I want to look at now is a way that, well, let me go back to my yeah, let me go back to the example I gave just a second ago where I stubbed my toe. So, or even, even better yet, and not to be too macabre, but I'm just trying to create a very nice uh, example here. So rather than stubbing my toe, <gasps> I got my toe cut off. Mm. But my point is, is that my physical form changed. I, meaning I don't have a toe anymore. So that can cause agitation. Or there's the actual sensation of the pain of the toe being removed. And so that could be the self and that causes agitation. But let's say that you are one of these really stoic people, super mindful, super in control. And even though your big toe got cut off, you could stand aloof from it. You could stand 
outside of the sensation of the pain and observe the pain and in and not identify with it not associate with it recognize that it's a phenomena that's happening but not exactly cling to it as self but there's probably still the idea that there's a perceiver of this big toe being cut off event. So it's not about the body of form. It's not about the sensations, but it's about the perceiving. And so who or what is the self? The perceiver. That then that self could be considered synonymous with perception or self is somehow related to perception or self is in perception or perception is in self. And I mixed those two, the two last ones I got backwards. But you see my point that we could locate the self in perception in that way. But the same thing is going to happen in terms of when that perception changes, it causes agitation in that way. Everybody doing okay with perception as this possible hiding place of the self. But again, we also want to pay attention to like just where dukkha is coming from. So next up, of course, is samskara, the conditioning. So we're getting very subtle now because we're getting into like the Un, you know, the under inner workings of the mind in that way. So the idea is, is that you could say, all right, Buddha, I'm not the physical body of form. I'm not the sensations because those are always changing. I'm not perception because that changes as well. But perhaps <clears throat> I am, excuse me, perhaps I am the conditioning. And this is what this one is weird, but you actually kind of need to know, or it's helpful to know that there is this sort of idea of, well, without getting too complicated, actually, I was going to make this way too complicated. This idea that the self is synonymous with the conditioning or that the conditioning is in self, these kind of options, it's very tricky with conditioning. But if, if you understand that a another helpful translation of samskara is habit energy or just habits. And so it's the idea that you are your habits in that way. But what we want to notice, and this is a really interesting one regarding habits. I, I got to tell you, this is something that I'm very bad about in my life, in my practice. And what it is, is I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, what is it called? Like a, a creature of habit, meaning I like things the way I like them. And I am very conditioned in that way. I, I'm conditioned in terms of going to bed at the same time every night. I'm conditioned in terms of kind of the way I eat. I'm conditioned about all of these things. And what I notice personally is the great degree of agitation that develops in me when I can't fulfill my habituation. It's a practice for me to actually chill out on like on that. We, we, we went out the other night. And it was way past my bedtime. And I noticed the conditioned mind getting agitated because the conditioning was not being allowed to do what it is conditioned to do in that way. Now, we could, again, try to find the self in the conditioning. And that's a very interesting pursuit of like just trying to locate the self in conditioning. But tonight, I'm more interested in this arising of the agitation from the attachment to the conditioning. 
That makes sense, everybody. I'm sorry if I'm moving too too quickly through this, but we got to get to how to be not agitated from not clinging. I can't leave us just in this clinging state of agitation. So, of course, the final last skandha consciousness. The self is obviously synonymous with consciousness, right? Self is consciousness, or there is consciousness in the self, meaning the self is conscious, right? Or there is consciousness as in self or self as in consciousness. So it's all of these ways of equating in one way or another, equating the self with consciousness. Now, the one thing that I need to mention, because I didn't say this last week, but I started to say it and I, and just, we didn't make it or I didn't make it all the way to saying it. If you remember last week, one of the main ideas I was trying to get across regarding the aggregates, the five aggregates, I was really trying to get across the point that each one of these is an aggregation. And then the aggregation of earth, earth, water, fire, and air, meaning form, that aggregate then aggregates with sensations, which are also aggregates which aggregate with perceptions, which are aggregates, which aggregate with samskaras, which are aggregates, which aggregate with consciousness. But what I didn't really mention last week that I wanted to, in American psychology, consciousness is singular. And so, there is just being conscious or not being conscious. But we need to understand that in the world of Buddhism, there are six consciousnesses. There is, and this is where, by the way, the term vijnana, in this instance, it's probably better translated as awareness. Just to be skillful, because we talk in Buddhism, we talk about I consciousness, but what we mean is visual awareness, auditory awareness, olfactory awareness, gustatory awareness, tactile awareness, and then cognitive awareness. And all six of those are interworking right now to construct what you are experiencing as a singular conscious moment. But it is an aggregation of sounds, smells, tastes, tactile formations, and then mental formations as well. So consciousness is not singular, it's already an aggregation. So that's important to keep in mind right there. But then there's this same thing going on, which is that there's this equating or associating of the self with consciousness. This is, again, what the common worldling, unskilled in the Dharma, the consciousness is the self or the self is consciousness or whatever, but there's this relationship. And then what the sutra tells us, of course, is that but then that consciousness changes and alters. And with the change and alteration of consciousness, consciousness becomes preoccupied with the change of consciousness. Agitation and a constellation of mental states born of preoccupation with the change of consciousness remain obsessing the mind. Because the mind is obsessed, one is frightened, distressed, anxious, and through clinging, one becomes agitated. It is in such a way, bhikshus, that there is agitation through clinging. All right, 
So any questions about all of that? Again, I think this is a really, really important message about uh, important message, but also like an important an important lesson in investigating dukkha. And what I mean is we we know about stress. you know, many of us know all too well about stress and anxiety. This is giving us some tools for looking at what might be causing that. Are you agitated in alterations and changes in your body or in your sensations or in what you're perceiving or what your habits are or what your consciousness is? It's things to look at. It's things to notice in that way, right? And how bhikshus? Is there non-agitation through non-clinging? Here, bhikshus, the instructed noble disciple who is a seer of the noble ones and who is skilled in their dharma, who is a seer of superior persons and is skilled and disciplined in their dharma, does not regard form as self. or does not believe the self as possessing form or form as in self or self as in form. Then for our noble disciple who is skilled in the Dharma, then that form changes and alters. But despite the change and alteration of form, consciousness does not become preoccupied with the change of form. No agitation and constellation of mental states born of preoccupation with the change of form, none of that remains obsessing the mind. Because the mind is not obsessed, one is not frightened, not distressed, not anxious, and through non-clinging, one does not become agitated. This noble disciple, again, does not regard sensations as self or perceptions as self or samskara or conditionings as self or consciousness as self. And so, or, you know, or self as possessing consciousness or consciousness as in self or self as in consciousness. Then, that consciousness changes and alters, but despite the change and alteration of consciousness, one's consciousness does not become preoccupied with the change of consciousness. No agitation, no constellation of mental states born of preoccupation with the change of consciousness, none of that remain obsessing the mind. Because the mind is not obsessed, one is not frightened, not distressed, not anxious. And through not clinging, one does not become agitated. It's in such a way, bhikshus, that there is no agitation through clinging, or that there is non-agitation through non-clinging. All right. So, it was only in the second half that the Buddha came around to talking basically, not exactly, by the way, He's not talking exactly about no self. It's actually a little more subtle than that. But what he did say, though, is that a wise, skillful, one who is wise and skilled in the Dharma. Let me make sure I get the language right. Yeah. Does not regard form as self. Or form as possessing self or all those other things. So the noble disciple, a quote unquote good Buddhist, does not regard the physical body as form. The good disciple doesn't regard sensations as self. 
doesn't regard perception as self, doesn't regard samskara or conditioning as self, and doesn't regard consciousness as self. Doesn't cling in that way. Or to use my language, doesn't appropriate in that way. But I want you to notice that this sutra doesn't exactly say no self. It's just talking about not thinking there's a self in the body of form, not thinking there's a self in sensations, and so on and so on. One of the things to think about, by the way, regarding this idea, it's it's some it's an idea that came to my mind when I was reading that last part. We want to be thinking about so. We want to be thinking about stimuli, things happening. And what I mean by that is throughout the day, we see so much stuff. Throughout the day, we hear so much stuff. And what I mean is, is that most of the time when these things happen, I don't become preoccupied with them. And what I want you to be thinking about is think about or contemplate the infinitude, the infinite amount of stimuli that happened to you today that just, that just, you don't even remember. Kind of, what's the expression? In one ear, out the other. And what I want you to be thinking about is how unagitated you are <laughs> with all of those things that you just didn't even pay any attention to today. Notice how you don't care about them. Notice how they didn't stick to you in that way. And again, all, all we're doing here tonight is noticing that when my mind doesn't get fixated and preoccupied with things, I don't get agitated with those things. But when the mind becomes preoccupied with things, it does begin to obsess, and an obsessive mind is a suffering mind in that way. This sutra has given us a little bit of insight into where that agitation and anxiety is coming from. And what we want to notice is that it's coming from change. And so, again, there is a state of mind that is clinging to a particular body of form and saying, this is me. And then when we start losing our hair, maybe, Oh my God, now this is an alteration of change that is going to obsess the mind. And there's going to be this feeling that I'm not how I should be. Versus there's this now. <laughs> oh, there's this now. <laughs> In that sense. And again, there's no... um. Again, I, I mentioned it earlier, we're reserving judgment, we're not finger pointing, it's nothing like that. It's about just noticing things that cause agitation, but then tonight is about the deeper level of why. Why would that cause agitation? And the text is revealing to us it causes agitation because you're clinging to the old way. And, and because you're clinging to that, there's a refusal to accept the new way, and then the mind becomes obsessed with the new, meaning, you know, my new, the, the pain in my big toe, this new pain. I become obsessed with it because I'm clinging to the old way when my toe didn't hurt. And I'm wondering, like, when can we get back to the me, the real me? But if there could be this understanding that, oh, it's, it is this now, then there could be the alleviation of that agitation in that sense. Questions, comments, answers, ideas about 
The suture? Yeah, no way. Uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, lovely. Well, so, so that's I, the me and not me. Excuse me. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> we love that expression. Um, in the heart suture, the emptiness. That form is empty. That avalar, the tissue, are, this is empty, this is empty, this is empty. And I like this. I, but what comes to my mind, if I may, is that so I sit in contemplation of emptiness. But there it is again. I sit in contemplation of emptiness. So I, could you speak to that a little bit for me? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm going, Noe, I want to say something important that your question has brought up. And if this doesn't kind of answer your question, then let me know. So Noe just introduced the Heart Sutra. And the Heart Sutra, of course, is a Mahayana Buddhist text. But I have been meaning to mention the Heart Sutra because we are dealing with the section on the Skandhas. And what I want to remind everybody is that this sutra, the Pali Sutra that we're reading tonight, is of the early form of Buddhism. And in the early form of Buddhism, there is a physical body of form, and it is always changing. There are also sensations of the sensory organs, and there is perception, and there is conditioning, and there is consciousness. In the early form of Buddhism, represented by the sutra we're reading tonight, there's no self. Excellent, Noe, you allowed me to come back to the chariot. So, Vajira, the wise, the extremely wise Vajira, has told us about how the chariot, that's just a label. That's just a word. And what is it a word or a label for? Wheels, an axle, a cab, the cart, meaning all the parts. There are, in early Buddhism, there are wheels and axles and all of that. But when you put all of those parts together, a chariot is just a label. Similarly, in early Buddhism, there are eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and brain, and that's the body of form. There is a body of form, which is experience or which is firing off sensations, which is perceiving, and this meat bag is conditioned, and there is consciousness. But the single entity, Michael, is just a label slapped on the forehead. Hi, my name is Michael. But it's just a label. But And I don't mean the word Michael. I mean the idea of the one me being. So in early Buddhism, there's no self. But there are five skandhas, there are the five aggregates, and they, they exist, they're real, they're in space and time, obeying laws of physics, all of that. But then the Bodhisattva Avilokiteshvara in the Mahayana Buddhist tradition got around to contemplating the aggregates and realized, oh, they're also empty, meaning they too are just a label. They too are like that self. And that, by the way, everybody, is the Mahayana revolution. That the skandhas are empty too, not just the self. So if you want to understand Hinayana Mahayana, Hinayana is that there are five skandhas, there just isn't a self. But in the Mahayana, the skandhas are empty too. 
they are also just conventional labels, just conventional terms that ultimately don't refer to anything real. Now, Noe's question was about this, who's contemplating the emptiness of the skandhas? Was, am I right, Noe? I, I think I mentioned it. It's the Bodhisattva Avilokiteshvara that's contemplating emptiness. And I would suggest, and this is my very subtle reading of the Heart Sutra, and many of you have taken my Heart Sutra class, so you know this, but for me, when one is contemplating the profound pranyaparamita, one is the Bodhisattva Avilokiteshvara. Because that's what it is to be Avilokiteshvara, is to contemplate emptiness. There is no Noe or Michael contemplating emptiness. That's absurd. So, yay. <laughs> Any other questions, comments, answers, or ideas? <clears throat> All right, everybody. I, let's call it a night there. I think we will spend at least another night on the skandhas. Uh, there's plenty here in the in the Samyutta Nikaya to explore. So thanks, Noe. <laughs>